Okay. Two cents before we going into to talk about physics again. A reminder that uh, there is no class on Friday. Uh, I will post the tenth and final problem set later today. Um, I will also post the lecture video, the, the official video on musical instruments, which I've j just well, I'm almost completed with editing. Um, so it'll, it'll be done shortly. I'm sorry to get, again, so, so behind. What else? Any other questions, things about outside of class issues? Um, I got a, a question just now, before I go back into talking about clocks and finally musical instruments, a uh, question about you all should have turned in problem set nine um, a, a minute ago or before. A question about these, these scenarios in the, in the cabaret where you have moist air or dry air and a contain, you know, water in the drain or no water in the drain, which one has more entropy? That, that story, hopefully you all are familiar with that for having suffered over it recently. And so I, I, let, me, let me say two cents about that. And, and that is, I, I visualize this question, it, it, it's equivalent to a, a very, the very simplest possible, simplest scenario of that is sort of two views of the same situation, the, the, same, the same constituents, the same overall components in the, in the story. Here's, here's my story. It's, it's imagine a room that's sealed off from everything else in the universe, just an isolated room with air and water in it in a, in a bucket. And I take two photographs of that room. One of the, in one of those photographs, the water is in the bucket and the air is, is dry. That's one, that's one photograph. The other photograph is the bucket is empty and the, room is, the air is full of moist air. The room is full of moist air. The, the constituents are the same. You count the molecules, they're all the same. Same number of water molecules, same number of air molecules, everything is the same. Um, which happened first and which happened second gives you great insight. Well, actually, if, if you let, in, in my, my little hypothetical scenario, one of them evolved into the other. There were two photographs of the same room taken without any intervention on my part. I just took a photograph, waited a while, took a second photograph. And which one happened first? Which one happened second? In this isolated system, thermally isolated in principle, the law of entropy holds sway. It's the boss here. And it will not allow the entropy of the system to go down. So if one evolves into the other, you can be sure that the second, the, the destination, is higher in entropy. The law of entropy forces it. And you know which one's going to happen second. It's the, the natural arrangement of things is if you put the bucket of water uh, in the dry air, it's going to evolve until the bucket's empty and the, water, the, the, the air is full of moisture, is, is humid air. So you know that the, the water separated from the air, that's the low entropy, low disorder arrangement. The water distributed through the air is the high entropy uh, arrangement. OK so far? There is the issue of, of thermal energy in this story. And that is that the water evaporating will require thermal energy. Water doesn't, the water molecules don't come apart and go off on their own uh, for free. You have to pay the latent heat of evaporation to rip up the molecules apart from one another and send them on their way. So the amount of thermal energy in the story, in this, in this my scenario, goes down as the water evaporates. And as the thermal energy goes down, so does, the, so does its contribution to entropy. So the thermal, thermal energy component of entropy is decreasing as time is, is continuing onward. And that makes the law of entropy nervous, because that by itself is a bad, you know, law of entropy won't, won't allow it. If that's all that happened, is that less thermal energy, the room got colder, the entropy's down. Uh-oh. So what pays for that? What pays for that is the, is the entropy created by mixing water with air. Water vapor with air vapor. That scrambling that happens creates a lot of entropy. And that pays for the lost entropy due to th the decreasing thermal energy. It's OK? All right. I'll leave that then and uh, go back to talking about clocks. So this entire section, well, the chapter of the book, 
is all, <clears throat> all about harmonic oscillators. So we're seeing them in the, in the simplest context that's sort of a practical interest, which is clocks. Clocks are all built around harmonic oscillators until the, the very modern era where, there, where some of the fanciest of the clocks uh, are built with, with things even more sophisticated than, than harmonic oscillators. So the earliest of the harmonic oscillators was the pendulum. It's not quite perfect. It's a perfect harmonic oscillator, but it's so close that for all practical purposes, it's a harmonic oscillator. It fulfills the requirement. It meets the rules. And the rule of a harmonic oscillator is you got to have a, a system with a stable equilibrium and the restoring influence that shows up when you take the system out of equilibrium is proportional to how far you take it out of equilibrium. The, the, um, the yeah. So, and springs do this naturally. Uh, springs have Hooke's law, which is, which is perfect for, for harmonic oscillators. Other things have very similar uh, restoring forces that are, again, that are proportional to displacement. Once you've got a harmonic oscillator, the, the, the good news or the, the, uh, the, the side effect, the result of having a harmonic oscillator is you've got this cool behavior where the period of oscillation, how long it takes each cycle of the oscillation, is independent of the amplitude of the oscillation. So whether it's doing a little, a little cycle or a big cycle, it takes the same amount of time. And that's great for clocks. It allows them to keep time better. Um, for musical instruments, we'll see it's crucial for most musical instruments. Most mu musical instruments play the same pitch whether you play them loud or soft. Um, that's not entirely true. There's some, there some twangy instruments that as the, as the volume changes, they, the pitch changes a bit. They, they, they swoop, either up or down, you know, pew or pew. But most instruments, whether you play a you know, piano, you hit, the, you hit the note, you, get a, you, you play quietly, you play hard, same note, you get the same pitch. It's, there's harmonic oscillator underlying this. The amplitude doesn't matter. Because it'll, it'll turn out, and if I forget to say this, I'm saying it now, the loudness of, of, of the music played by a musical instrument is directly related to the amplitude of the oscillation. There shouldn't be any surprise, but I might as well say it. OK? So with, with clocks, I, I, talk, I walked us through pendulums as a harmonic oscillator. They're fine for, for clocks that you put in place and leave there all day and all year, like grandfather clocks or wall clocks. I did a short version of ring balances, which is it's a torsional harmonic oscillator. So something that, that, ro that rotates like a wheel going back and forth with a restoring force exerted by a spring. Springs are great. They, 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 they live by Hooke's law. And this is a torsional thing, and it lives by a torsional Hooke's law. But the restoring force, restoring torque on the wheel is proportional to displacement. It's a harmonic oscillator. It has a period that doesn't depend on uh, amplitude of motion. That's great. Um, the value of, the, of doing this torsional system is that gravity doesn't matter. If you make the whole thing rotate about its own center of mass in this, in this motion, the, the little wheel go back and forth about its own center of mass, which is easily arranged, then gravity, which remember gravity pulls on things right at their center of gravity, which coincides with their center of mass. So gravity doesn't exert any torque on, on objects about their center of mass. We did this in the you know, acrobats flying through the air, or bowling pins flying through the air, something like that. You know, what, what stays constant? Angular momentum. Why? Because gravity doesn't exert torques on things about their center of mass. Remember that story? Well, it shows up in balance rings too. If you don't yank, you yank on it with gravity, no torque. So balance ring clocks and watches and stuff are sort of uh, oblivious to gravity and therefore oblivious to lots of stuff like how you tilt them and so on. And they keep good time regardless of whether you move around. And as just an aside, there was, in my opinion, a, you know, a fabulous book called Longitude that's now probably 15 years old or maybe, you know, give or take, writing about a fellow named Harrison in uh, in, in the 17th century England, uh, way back when, navigation was really problematic. You'd send a ship out to sea, and they had a tough time figuring out where they were while they're sailing around. And they could easily m misjudge where they were and, and crash and disaster. So what was the problem? They could figure out what their latitude was, that is, towards north and south. They could tell when they were far up north. How, uh, 
far down south by looking at the stars and the moon and stuff. The, the, the stars look different in the southern hemisphere, for example, than the northern hemisphere. So they can figure out where they are north and south latitude. What they couldn't figure out was longitude, where they are uh, east and west, and that's because the Earth rotates. And so every, all points on the Earth's surface at a certain latitude have an opportunity to, to, to sort of visit all orientations over the course of a day. And how do you tell them apart? Um, so there was a huge effort in the, in the 1600s to try to solve the longitude problem, help sailors know where they were, east-west, because um, it, was, it was a matter of life and death, really. And there was a huge prize offered for this and all by the, by the British government. And one approach to, to solving this problem was to know the time extremely accurately uh, and, therefore, and look at the stars. And if you knew what time it was, and you knew where the stars were, you could figure out where you were east-west with great precision. And th so they needed a, to, to, to do the problem, they needed a clock that would keep time to within five seconds, I believe, over the course of a voyage the, uh, across the Atlantic, for example. So that five seconds over, over a period of, of weeks is, is a challenge. It was a huge challenge. And Harrison finally solved it. He finally made a clock that accurate. It was a small clock. He started with these big monster clocks. Uh, he may have managed to make one. It was, I don't know, it's about like this size. And it's, it's the first real chronometer. And it, it kept time that accurately. And it won the prize, but it took him something like 20 years to finally get the prize, because naturally, the, the government doesn't really want to pay out the money they promised. Um, but it was a balance ring clock. So it, it, it kept time, used that little balance with lots of corrections for, for problems, compensations for problems. So that, anyway, uh, solved the longitude problem. And ultimately now, you, know, you, got, you guys are used to GPS. You know where you are anytime you like, trivially. But you know, back, way back when, uh-uh, it was tough. And, and having a very accurate clock that could tolerate a sea voyage and the motions associated with was, was, was a key. And he did it. Is that OK? So balance ring is a, is a timekeeper. In the, and, and balance ring clocks were the, were the, were the clocks of, of my childhood. So I had wristwatches that were balance ring wristwatches. Um, and they would typically gain or lose a minute a day. And I, used to, I would know how they would drift, and I could correct for it so I could predict when the bell would ring, which was a big deal to me back when I was in sixth grade. Three, two, one, ring, yay! OK, we're out of here. I paid a lot of attention, didn't I? Um, so, but but the, the current era, I mean, apart from the, from the fact that many of you don't even have watches anymore, you rely on your cell phones and so on, uh, the watches that people do wear, if they wear them, I do, um, are quartz, typically quartz watches. And what's inside a quartz watch is another harmonic oscillator. It's a harmonic oscillator that's based on a piece of quartz, and it turns out a single solid can act as a harmonic oscillator. And the idea behind this is, if you take a block of solid, I don't want to grab that. This. If it, suppose this is solid, this, because it's got a stiffness in the material itself, can vibrate as a harmonic oscillator, with the two ends moving first toward each other and compressing the middle, and having the middle go, wait a second, we're under uh, compression, push out, push out, restoring force. Then, the, the ends will be pushed back, and they'll, they'll fly outward, and, get, and the, the, the object will get longer, and it will stretch. And as it does, restoring forces will show up that pull it back in, and it will go back and forth. It's basically bouncing about, back and forth about its equilibrium length. And you can get something going like that. Uh, so a rod like this. So it's a single object, one piece of aluminum. And I can get it to, to bounce off the middle. So the both, both ends are go toward each other, essentially bounce, go apart, stretch, bounce, come back and forth. And the way you can get this guy going is, is by dragging your fingers across it. It's got, is the rosin on this end or is the rosin on this end? It, it needs rosin to do this. Let me get my fingers sticky. Here we go. Oh, come on. We used to have a... Al was doing it before class, and he got it going nicely. Now I can't do it. 
what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a stick slip effect to show up where I grab the bar as it moves with me and then, it, then I release. Then I grab it again and release. It's not trivial to do this. Come on. It's, it's equivalent to bowing it, but I can't get it to go. We used to have a spray bottle that worked so well. Anyway, I lost it. Sorry. Okay. You can imagine it can go bounce like that. And it, it gives, it's a loud shriek when it worked, which is fun, but okay, I can't do it. I'll just shriek for it. Ah! Yeah, okay. Um, but it's a very well-defined rhythm. It's a harmonic oscillator. Everything's good about it. it, it it's perfect for keeping time. It has a, a sort of in the range of the right frequency for a clock that is in that, in that object. The pitch, of the, the, the frequency of the motion, I should define frequency. Frequency is one over period. Uh, so period is how many seconds per cycle. Frequency is how many cycles per second. The reverse, the, the reciprocal. Um, it has about the right number of cycles per second for a clock. You don't want the cycles to be too rapid because clocks have to count the cycles to advance their second hand, minute hand, hour hand. And the counting process consumes energy. And if it's going to be a wristwatch, you don't really want to be wearing out the energy too fast, changing the battery all the time, that, that kind of stuff. So you want the counting, you want the, the, the harmonic oscillator, which could be a, just a piece of aluminum like that. Um, you want its, its frequency, the number of cycles per second, to be relatively slow so you don't have to count them super fast and burn up energy in the, in the uh, battery. You don't, also don't want them to be too slow because you'll hear them. And that's what the point of this is supposed to be. And I've got to try it one more time. It's probably my hands are dry. And if I get, come on, buddy. This is so irritating. You know, it, it's that tone. Can I get it? Can I sustain it? Nah. Can you hear it? Yeah, okay, so I, I cheated. I'm, I'm putting all the energy in a single smack as opposed to putting it rhythmically once per cycle. But it's, anyway, so you would hear a watch that had, had that as its timekeeper. So they want to you know, send the pitch up higher out of audible range. So you want it out of audible range, but not so fast that you have to count like crazy. Um, and and that, so that's what's going on in my watch. It's got, it's got a harmonic oscillator and they're made of a single piece of not aluminum, but, crisp, but, but quartz crystal. And the pitch is out of the audible range, but barely. Uh, obviously, that rod is a little long for a watch. So what do you do? Don't use the, a whole solid piece. Cut the middle out of it and make it soft, soften the restoring forces, so that the, that's, which slows things down. Weaker restoring forces drops, prolongs the period of a harmonic oscillator, or equivalently, lowers the frequency of a harmonic oscillator. So cut the middle out. So this is aluminum, so is this. This is also aluminum. But now, it, in fact, the, what matters really is, is this distance from this to this. It's, this is going to move, the two times will move toward each other away, toward away, toward away. So it, it, it's like a bar that's only this long which by itself would have a very high pitch. It would be very stiff. It would hate to be sh shortened or lengthened by, any, by five millimeters. So it's very stiff, and also it's got very little mass. So it'll go through its cycles really fast, way too fast. You know, this, this has a pitch that's somewhere in the mid-audible mid range. A bar this long would be way up in the stratosphere. But by cutting the middle out of it, it's much, got a much weaker restoring force and it's in the audible range again. Still aluminum. And, and it, all the details don't matter so much as it's got, it fulfills the requirements. It's got the ends go toward each other, away from each other, toward e away. So that's the inertial part is those ends, their mass. And the restoring force is the, the U-shaped connection between them, which wants them to be at a certain distance from each other, no more, no less. And provides restoring forces back. And if I take it away from, the, from equilibrium and let go, it, it goes back and forth about equilibrium. And the restoring forces are proportional to displacement, which is re required for harmonic oscillator. 
it's got a well-defined period that doesn't depend on how big the amplitude of motion is. So the pitch, which again, the sound we hear is pitch. The pitch is steady even as the loudness changes. Okay? So by softening the restoring forces on a piece of solid material, you can make a smaller harmonic oscillator with the, with, in the pitch range you want. If you try to make it out of solid material that doesn't have a, 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 the chunk in the middle cut out, by the time you make it small enough to put in a wristwatch, the, fre the frequency is too high. I hope that's followable. So they needed a trick to make very small single object harmonic oscillators with lower frequencies, ones that you could deal with. And so they make, a, they make a little tuning fork out of quartz. That's what, what's inside a wristwatch, a tiny tuning fork made out of quartz. And I'm going to show it to you. It's sitting up here. I, and I've got a bunch of these, but I cut, I, I cut them open periodically. They have a silver coating on the quartz, and the silver tarnishes. So when you look at this, which you will do in a second, doc camera. Dun, dun, dun. There it is. Um, it looks black down here. It used to be shiny silver, but that only lasts a couple days. It was inside a, a, a little can went around, like a, like a soda can. Very t it's also in the picture. I can scoot it over. There is the can that used to be on, on top. Uh, there was vacuum. In, uh, it was evacuated. So the, so the little tuning fork sat there vibrating in, empty, in, uh, in, op in air, not air, in no air. Let me just see where can I point this. So you can see the slice going through the middle, right? So it's one tine of the tuning fork, the other tine. And there's, you know, so it, it's made of a very hard material, crystalline quartz, the same quartz that you see, you know, in a new age store, you know, to, in crystals, right? Why that? Why not aluminum or some other, other hard material? It's because quartz has another interesting property. It's what's known as a piezoelectric material. Uh, piezoelectric material, has the property that its mechanical uh, character, you know, how big it is, how, how, much you, how you push on it and stuff, affects its electrical behavior. And its electrical behavior affects its mechanical behavior. They're, connect, they're connected, they're coupled. If you change its shape, it does electrical things. If you change its electrical things, it changes its shape. An example of a piezoelectric system is the spark starters on a gas grill or a, or a stove. It's a crystal in there. It could even be a quartz crystal that you smack with a with a little hammer, and that mechanical jo uh, change shape change that you induce as a result causes an electrical effect and a, the spark. Well, this guy is is piezoelectric. It's got metallizations put on the little tuning fork, and that allows them to electrically use electrical impulses to get the tuning fork going, and it starts to vibrate. And then they can watch the vibration electrically because the, the mechanical motion affects its electrical behavior. So, they, so they, 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 they get a jiggling and then they listen to the jiggle electrically. And that's quartz watches. They're just counting, beyond that, it's just counting the vibrations. Is that okay? All right, let me come back to live here. All right. Any other questions about clocks? Okay, that said, let me, let me turn to another example of harmonic oscillators in action. Musical instruments, they're all about harmonic oscillators. Again, with rare exceptions, there are musical instruments that, with twang that are not quite harmonic oscillators or, or maybe far from it. And the idea is that, that when you take musical instruments, um, they're a little more complicated than the harmonic oscillators I've talked about up until this point, because all the harmonic oscillators to this point, the clock ones are sort of a single system, a single object, one, one thing with mass and one, one restoring force, and they, it goes through one simple motion, nothing, no, no variety pack. We'll see that with musical instruments, by and large, they deal with a, an extended object, typically a, like a string that, that goes from one place to another. It's a, it extends, it has a length, it has a size and the size matters, and it's got multiple parts that can move independently to some extent of one another. The string can have a very complicated shape if it likes. Uh, so strings, a column of air, 
from left to right across a musical instrument like a, like a, like a recorder. What vibrates in a musical instrument like this, all the, the wind instruments, the brass instruments, uh, pipe organs, it's not, the, it's not the, the shell, it's not the plastic in this case. It's the air inside that does the vibration. And again, it's extended. It, it goes from one side to the other. It's got a length to it. Um, and it, the different parts of that air column can, can have somewhat independent ability to move or, or change their density and pressure. So we'll see they all involve harmonic oscillators. But it turns out each one has multiple ways in which it can behave as a harmonic oscillator, each of which uh, meets the requirement the, the rules, what, is it, what do you need to have a harmonic oscillator? You need to have a system with a stable equilibrium and restoring influences that are proportional to displacement from equilibrium. You do that, you got a harmonic oscillator. I should also say, just a, again another side, is harmonic oscillators are, they're the best understood physical systems and concept in nature. I mean, people, we, we, we understand them really well, all the way deep into the, the world of quantum physics and all that stuff. And so, Anytime you can reduce a more complicated problem to the story of harmonic oscillators, man, that's the way you go. It's, it's just, uh, yeah, it's the path of least resistance of some sort. So, having said all this, about a string. First, the first, there are lots of stringed instruments, and they all involve a string that is under tension. And the tension gives the string an equilibrium shape, namely straight. And if you take the string away from equilibrium, it develops restoring influences. Now, exactly how you take it away, because it's complicated in many pieces to the string, in effect. It's got lots of segments. How you take it away from, from equilibrium is complicated. Um, and what the restoring forces are when you take it arbitrarily away from equilibrium, like you pull this part down that far and that part, you know, what, what restoring influences you get are kind of messy. But it turns out that if you think of the string as as being distorted in, in, a, in, a, in one or more very simple ways, it becomes possible to understand it. And the, the way in which to think of it that works the best is to think of it as being able to distort as, as a single arc, and therefore as one, one string, or as two arcs going in opposite directions, as two half strings, or three arcs going in alternating directions, as, as uh, three one-third strings, and so on. Those distortions, they're very simple. They have very simple characteristics. And each of them behaves. It fulfills the requirements of a harmonic oscillator and behaves as a harmonic oscillator. And I realize even as I'm saying that, that that's kind of a lot of words. What the hell does that mean? Let me show you those distortions. So we've got a string across here, left to right. It's under tension because it's got some weights at the end. And I'm going to shake it. And the shaking process is, it, we're getting, we're, I'm trying to get it to vibrate. I could pluck it, but I can't pluck it the way I want to. So I'm going to shake it a little bit. And hopefully, we'll get it going. And it's now vibrating as a single arc, up and down, up and down. Are you OK with that? I can turn it, turn, if I turn off the lights, there's a flash system here that might, you can see, this is the arc at its, at its top, top, oh, it's evolving a little bit here. Ugh. This thing is never very reliable. It needs, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to light. Um, we're not getting what, what, I, what I want with the flash system. It's not, it's not helping. What I, what I want to point out is, is, and I'll get it back. I'll get it back so it's a single arc going up and down. That single arc, a very specific distort, type of distortion of the string, it's, it's given a fancy name. It's called the fundamental vibrational mode of the string. Vibrational mode, what's that? What's a mode? A mode is a, a simple possible choice in which the thing can vibrate. It's got various vibrational modes, different modes in which it can vibrate, which are, the, are the, sort of the simplest fundamental ways in which it can vibrate. Vibrational mode, vibration is a fancy word for, uh, not an alternative word for oscillation. So, so we're looking at ways in which it can, can, can go through a motion, cyclic motion, and do it in, in, 
and, and view them with this, the greatest simplicity. And as far as fundamental, this is the simplest of the vibrational modes. One arc, it also has the lowest frequency, the fewest cycles per second. And that, it, this mechanical system that drives it has never been very, and it's always flaky. This is just hopeless. What, oh, I know what I'm doing. Well, no, it's what I'm, it, it is what, no, I'm doing it right. Okay, I, I had it for a second. I, I have no choice in what speed uh, produces that single arc. It is a harmonic oscillator. It knows, it has a frequency defined by the, by the battle between inertia and restoring forces. I don't control that, that frequency. It controls that frequency. It's, it, it has to do with the, with the string's mass, with the weight on the end providing tension, and on the length of the string. Nothing else. So that, that, the, the frequency of that harmonic of that motion, completely determined. I'm just mucking around trying to find it, trying to jiggle it at the right frequency. It's like, it's like doing a, uh, a jump rope. Let me stop this altogether. I can jiggle it with my hand at that low frequency. I probably can get it going. It's just like with a jump rope. You can't, there it is. Right? I have no control over that frequency. I can't make it go twice as fast or half as fast. That's determined by the harmonic oscillator aspect of it. You okay with that idea? If I jiggle it twice as fast, it will, now we're getting to the, the, my limits. It, it should break up into two half strings. Now, now I'll use the gadget. It, it does better at, at higher frequencies than at lower frequencies. So my hand is great at low frequencies and high frequencies. There it is. Again, I have no, no control over this. It's determined by the, by the system. There it is. That is what's known as the second harmonic mode. It's, it's another vibrational mode, and different from the fundamental. I have no control over it. It fulfills the, this goes, drives me. It fulfills the requirements of a harmonic oscillator. When it's doing the two half strings, the, the, whenever it leaves equilibrium doing this two half string motion, the, a restoring influence shows up. And the restoring influence is proportional to how far it is away from equilibrium. It's a harmonic oscillator. It doesn't look like one. It's like a big messy thing doing, wa doing wacky, wavy stuff. But it behaves as a harmonic oscillator. I, again, I have no control over that, the, the frequency that, that, at which that occurs. It happens to be at exactly twice the frequency of the fundamental, which is why it's given a, a special name. It's called the second harmonic mode. Harmonic has to do with integer multiples of things. And so it, it occurs at twice the frequency of the fundamental. So if I go slowly, I get the fundamental. If I go twice as fast, I, get the, I should get that second harmonic mode. Okay? And I, I can't keep it going consistently. If I go three times as fast, I'll get the third harmonic mode. Oh, this is the fourth. See the four? Incidentally, this is called an antinode, maximum movement. This is called a node, no movement. So this, this has three extra nodes and the ends, five total nodes, four antinodes. Six, seven. Okay. So it turns out that the string can vibrate and it is right now. It's vibrating in multiple, several of those modes at once. But if we just single out one of them, it's simple. If we see two of them at once, it's a mess. If we see five of them, it's, it's, it's hard to, to understand altogether. But using the mode, th those vibrational modes, the fundamental and the various harmonics, they're all, they're all integer multiples. The frequencies are all integer multiples of the fundamental. They're all harmonics. Um, they can describe any any motion in the string, all the possibilities, whatever you like, you can sort of assemble it out of, the, out of the mode pieces. And the modes themselves have simple behaviors. They're harmonic oscillators with well-defined frequencies, okay? So when you're playing a, a stringed instrument, however you get the thing going, you can decompose, it's gonna be doing complicated stuff when you pluck it or you bow it. Um, you can disassemble sort of the, uh, that, that complicated motion into the sum of simple motions, 
which is the ones I just showed you. And since each one has its own pitch, when you have the string doing complicated stuff, it's going to be emitting several pitches at once. The pitch according, associated with the fundamental, if there's a lot of fundamental motion in it, if it's also got some half, the two half string motion in it, it's going to have some of that, that pitch, which is twice the frequency of the fundamental. You, you okay with this so far? Uh, so strings, yeah, so strings have this complicated range of possibilities. Um, the, I should, should tell you, so what sets the fundamental pitch? It's, again, the mass, a battle between the mass, which is the inertial part, and the restoring influences, which pull it back. The mass originate, you know, is basically is, is the mass of the string. You, know, it, it, you can go and shake it and see how much mass the string has, how much in, it resists in acceleration. So that's the inertial part. The restoring force influence part has two pieces to it. One of them is how tense the string is, how much tension you put in it. The tauter you pull that string, the stiffer it becomes, the harder it is to pull it, the, the, more, the stronger the restoring influences that show up when you pull it away from center. So ten, increasing tension speeds everything up. The pitch, go, the pitch goes up. I mean, for those of you who have played musical instruments, higher pitch. Um, you can also change the length. If you shorten the string, by just pull, if I move the end bar over to make it shorter, that would have two effects. It would simultaneously reduce the mass of the string, which tends to speed things up. The motion gets faster because there's less inertia. And it stiffens the restoring force because as the string gets shorter, it, it, it gets more finicky about you pulling it off center. If the string is a mile long, pulling it an inch off center, it wouldn't even notice. If the string is only this long and you pull it an inch off center, it notices like crazy. You've, you've distorted it hugely. So the string, the, st the restoring force gets stiffer. More, uh, it fights you more when the string gets shorter. And so for people playing musical instruments, you, you, you start off picking the pitch by picking how massive the string is. So for most musical instruments, the low-pitched strings are mo massive strings. They're, they have extra meat to them to slow down the motion, more inertia. Uh, second thing you choose is the tension in the string. This is sort of the, the, the first level of adjustment of, of the pitch. More tension, stiffer restoring force, faster motion, higher pitch. And the last thing you do dur during playing is you, is you change the length of the string on the fly. You do it by, by, by sort of pinching off the end of the string and making it shorter, which both reduces the mass and stiffens the restoring force and shoves the, the pitch up. All right. What else would I want to say about this? Uh, they, the, the, the harmonics tend to be all present in, in a string. You, you, you can't play the string so it, it vibrates only in its fundamental mode. Almost anything you do it will get it both going in its fundamental mode and in its, um, vibra in, in its second harmonic, third harmonic, and stuff. And you'll hear them all. Uh, as far as for pitches, it turns out that factors of two and three and stuff are very familiar tone issues in, in music. So a factor of two in frequency, between, which, which is present in the, between the fundamental and the, and the second harmonic, is, is an interval known in music as the octave. So it's between ba, ba, that, that difference. That's a factor of two. And if you go another factor, you go to factor of three, uh, which you get between the fundamental and the third harmonic, the three third strings, that's an octave and a fifth. So it's, Ba, ba, mm, ha, mm, ba, ha, that, that, that interval. And if you do f the, four, the fourth harmonic is two octaves above the, above the fundamental. So ba, ha, ha, ha. Some of you are, what are these people have these five octave ranges. Oh, yeah, thank you. All right. So, so they, all, they work well together. The, 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 the harmonics work well together, which is... So, so stringed instruments and wind instruments, these, these linear ones, they have, they vibrate in multiple ways at once, but it all, it sounds okay. It, it, our, our ears like that sound, at least the Western ear does. Um, before, you know, rather than going on to, to wind instruments next, let me talk about how you get the energy in to the, to the, the, vi the vibrating motion, say, of a string. And the two most common ways to get the energy in are plucking and bowing. And plucking means 
that you do work pulling the string, which is under tension, has a stable equilibrium, and the potential to, to vibrate in these various vibrational modes. You pluck it away from equilibrium, a process which involves doing work on it. You exert a force on it, it moves a distance directly force, work. So you put it, you're putting energy in, and you let go, poof. And so it starts with full, full, packed full of energy, and it starts vibrating according to the, these various harmonic modes, uh, vibrational modes, and emits its sound. And you, you, know, you can hear that plucking effect. And another possibility is to rhythmically put the energy in, to get it going a little, and then every time it, it you know, comes at you, it's, it's like the two ways of getting somebody swinging on the swing. You know, Uncle so-and-so, Aunt so-and-so, me, can you push me on the swing? Yeah, OK, fine, OK? Right? So you, you give the kid, and then they swallow their gum, and then you get in trouble. Um, you, you do all, this is plucking. You know, you, you know, you know, a single dose of work. The alternative is to, 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 to watch it moving a little bit, and then push it every time it's heading away from you. So give it a little bit of energy rhythmically. Little work. You obviously don't want to push it as it's coming toward you. That's negative work. Push it as it's going away from you. Okay, and you get it going. And this is what happens in a lot of instruments. Uh, this is what bowing does. That is when you run a bow across the string. Um, what I was trying to do with that, with that rod unsuccessfully, uh, what blowing, across, blowing a wind instrument across the opening of a flute, for example. That, that's effectively bowing. Now I'll come back to that. And so you're rhythmically putting the energy in. And harmonic oscillators are very good at receiving energy via this rhythmic approach. Um, they have a well-defined frequency. It doesn't depend on amplitude. So you can just keep, do, keep pushing at the same rhythm. You don't even have to pay attention. You just keep pushing. And you'll get the energy to go in more and more. Uh, of course, you're competing with the energy coming out. But if you put it in faster, it comes out. You build up a bigger and bigger motion. And that's kind of fun in various ways. It allows for an effect which is, you know, is it really central to, to, to music? Mm, maybe. Um, it's a little bit of a stretch, but I, but I have fun with this anyway. You can move energy around between two harmonic oscillators with the same frequency. That is, it's two harmonic oscillators that have the same uh, period of motion. For example, these two, these two pendulums, they're, they're two identical pendulums. They're both harmonic oscillators, right? And they have the same period of motion. I could do that, but we'll waste time doing it. You know, they, they love to swing together. They're happy. And they're now connected very gently by a wimpy, wimpy, wimpy spring. And what will happen then is energy will move from one of the oscillators to the other by rhythmic pushes. What's known as, this is a resonant energy transfer, if you want to give a name to it. So let me get one of these, one of these pendulums going, and the other one not. Actually, I don't need, it doesn't even matter. The energy is moving gradually from this one to that one. And there will come a moment when it's all in this one, right about, well, we, we, I over, it got past me. Okay, We're, now it's all, coming out of this one, none. And now it's going to go out of, back into this one. God. Well, anyway, it's moving back and forth, and I'm having a tough time waving my hands to show you that. This guy's now got it. And it's coming back. Now this guy's getting it more and more. OK? You see the idea? So energy can move around between things with, that have this, the same natural uh, resonance, the na same natural frequency. And th these are harmonic oscillators. This, this works really easily. OK, rather than having you pay attention to that forever, try this. Two tuning forks. They are sitting on boxes. Why? Because tuning forks don't do a very good job of launching sound any more than strings do. They are too narrow. So as they move back and forth, whether it's a tuning fork like this or a string moving back and forth, the air goes around it rather than getting squished by it. To launch sound, you want to squish the air to high pressure and let go of it, to low pressure and back and forth. So clapping sends sound out. Just moving your hand, the sound of one hand clapping, ha, ha, ha. I can't compress the air very well. It goes around me, OK? So tuning forks have a trouble launching sound, which is why not much, right? The box helps. The box now allows it to, the, the tuning fork to convey a good fraction of its energy to the air. Okay? 
And this tuning fork sitting here minding its own business has the same pitch. If I do this, oh, prove me wrong. They gotta be the same. Okay, let's try this again. You got it? Okay, so the, 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 the energy can move. Um, any other important ones before the key one? So we can move energy from one system with a, with, a, with a frequency X to another system with frequency X. It goes by little rhythmic pushes, which takes us to this guy. And let me see what I can add. Ox east. Ox east. You are now looking down on a wine glass. So yes, we're gonna break the wine glass. And the, and the way we're gonna break the wine glass is we're gonna give it little rhythmic pushes at its favorite frequency. And I could in principle start with a, with a super powerful wine glass that I got going and it would convey its energy little by little to the other wine glass and shatter it. But instead we're gonna just use an audio system to, to sing basically at the wine glass at its natural resonance. It's a harmonic oscillator too and it will just accumulate more and more energy in that rhythmic motion about, about its equilibrium. Uh, you are looking down on it because you, the, the, its fundamental vibrational mode, the fundamental vibrational mode of a wine glass is a weird shape. It's not a, it's not a string, of course. It's this circular thing. It will distort from circular, as you look down to it, to oval one way, and then oval at right angles that way, back and forth. That's the, motion, that's the fundamental vibrational mode of the wine glass. Is that okay? And as we sing at it, it'll go into that mode bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's, Al, I believe, has set this up. So you'll get to see it at one extreme of its motion in, in a flash photogra photograph. And we'll, we'll, as, I put, as I turn up the loudness of the speaker system, it will distort more and more and more until finally it breaks. And it's obnoxiously loud, I apologize, but it is what it is. Is that okay? If I don't hit the resonance immediately, I'll have to play a little bit, but I'll, I'll go for it. That was so easy, I didn't even get to talk about it. <laughs> All right, um, stop. Uh, so nothing touched it. I mean, it did itself in, right? We, we essentially, essentially sung at it, at its resonance, and it, and it shattered. And it, in, uh, supposedly Caruso could do this, and maybe, maybe it's obvious that he certainly could do it. Um, it, it. It's still kind of stunning that somebody can do this. To do it, you have to, first of all, find the resonance of the glass. You have to match its frequency, and then you have to do work on it with every cycle. So you have to stay perfectly synced with it and give it little pushes with the air, with the, 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 the sound pressure, pushing it rhythmically each time it cycles, and have it gradually accumulate that energy until it breaks. And the wine glass, it, that, that it's a fancy wine glass helps, because that wine glass is very stiff, it has very little internal frictional problems. So it, it's, it stores energy very well, and I guess I should have showed you this. Uh, cheap glass, glass glasses, you, when you smack them, for example, they typically go thunk, you know, boom, boom. The, the sound is, there's a rhythmic rhythm to it, but it dies away very fast. This guy, it's a lovely harmonic oscillator. It's got the right restoring forces. The pitch doesn't depend on loudness, super duper. And it saves the energy well, because it keeps going for a long time. And this kind of glass, then you can sing at it, at its favorite note, get, it, get that motion going. And so instead of smacking with your finger, you're, you're equivalent of bowing it, you're getting it going more and more and more until it destroys itself. And there you have it. Okay. Uh, again, no class on Friday. See you on Monday. <laughs>